All right. I believe we are ready to install the oil pan. Now, because of this assembly right here, I'm gonna flip the engine upside down, but I need to make sure that this doesn't hit this. So I will turn it that way, but be cognizant of this right here. You don't wanna loosen this and then have your engine come over and slam and hit this and crack all of this, all right? Or worst case scenario, your head, all right? So it's gonna be pretty hard, I mean heavy, to spin it, but I'll spin it uh, slowly and I'll put the pin in so I can work in the bottom with the engine ups, you know, upside down. Okay, the oil pan. So the oil pan is dirty. It's got oil in it. Got some crud in there. So I'm gonna wipe it off clean, and then I'm gonna same thing. Use the razor blade, clean all of this, cause like I said, you don't want this stuff falling into the engine. So I'm gonna clean all of that up, all the way around, and then, you know, same procedure or handle bond it, get it ready, and install it on the engine once I flip it around. That's what's next. All right, so I just cleaned up the RTV off of this just like I did with the front cover. You know, I used razor blades and the drill bits to clean the holes. So one thing I want to mention is that when you use a razor blade on these, always have a whole bunch. But you can buy these in Harbor Freight, a box of them for a hundred, for fairly cheap, like two, three, uh, two, three dollars. But what I want to bring up is like you try to use half of it, all right, on on the uh, on the surface, and don't flip it like so because what happens is when this is going through the tip is bending upwards and if you flip it you're going to scratch all right so use half of it all right and if you see that that one of these can cause a, a nick where it can scratch then you flip it and continue all right and if it happens again grab another razor blade all right now the damaged razor blade you can use for the edges because the edges tend to be always rough all right and I mentioned you grab a, a quarter inch drill bit for these because are 10 mils and all you do is run it like like you're scraping outward right, and inward and you go around and all of the RTV will come right off the holes and then for an easier cleanup at the end of that once everything is wiped down and cleaned off just grab your air hose and you know spray it off so any RTV they might be in it will uh, fly out like so I don't know if you guys saw that but that was a piece of RTV stuck in there but you know visually inspect you don't want RTV in there because you don't want it to get caught on your oil pickup all right so now I'm gonna flip the engine around put RTV on there I'm gonna sit over there under the shade and put RTV on that and once I have it ready and upside down I'll come over and I'll hit record on the camera and continue showing you what I'm doing all right so just like mentioned before, I uh, inspected all the, the holes and looking for debris of RTV and everything's good. All I have to do so far is uh, razor blade this things off. I already uh, cleaned the tips of the screws to remove the RTV and that's ready for RTV. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this right here, slap some RTV on that and install it. All right, so everything's set. I forgot to remove the RTV on this thing. You grab right me. <clears throat> like I mentioned, try to always use a new razor blade to minimize scratching. All right. <clears throat> The oil pan will have uh, some pins and you do not have to RTV all the way to those little edges just around where the uh, oil is going to be at, just an FYI. So like I mentioned, there's some guide pins, there's going to be one here and right there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to line up the lower one first and then bring it over Push the top one in the bottom and then tap it there we go and now we install the screws
I says the top one hasn't gone down yet. I'm gonna use the screws to bring it down. There's push. Once you tighten all of them, what I like to do is I like to go over all of them because uh, again, simply because if it didn't go down flush, this will find the loose bolts. And they are tight. Perfect. Okay, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to install the lower alternator bracket, the crank pulley, and the lower uh, engine mount. Alright, first I'm going to get these started and um, I will torque them after they're all installed. One of the main things, like I mentioned before, take into consideration is that not to tighten everything until everything is seated. So I will torque it, but I'm gonna bring them down almost flush, and then I'll give it some uga dugas. But if I feel like it's hard going in, then I will loosen whatever tightened up first and then do it. But right now we're just gonna uga duga it. and we'll torque them later all right so for the crank um what i like to do is i like to wipe off the uh the surface is going to meet up with the uh with the seal all right and the pin i like to verify so what i do is i look in the hole because this has a long side and a short side and i see right in there I don't know if you can make it out, but up and down is the long side, and side to side is the short side. Alright, so that will tell me which way that goes. And there it is. And now this bolt gets tightened to 36 foot pounds, and then I think it's 90 degrees. This particular one, I send it with this all the way until it don't move no more. All right, it's moving barely, let me see. Yeah, that's good enough. So I haven't had any of these come out yet by doing that. So that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so the rear engine mount is uh, 54 foot pounds. And there they are. Alright, this bracket bolt I couldn't find, so I'm just gonna send it like I do with the impact. Yeah, there's barely any movement on those. So, I mean, if I keep going, it will definitely strip it. But I've been using this for so long that I know the size of the bolt and how long I can hit it for before I cause any damage. Because I've been. When I first got this tool, I freaking literally had blown up motors and broken stuff and I put this on it and I hit it a full power with, with a, a full battery to see how long it would take for 10 mils, 12 mils and uh, 14 mils to break. All right? And I, I, I'm going to know how to use this pretty well without damaging and leaving things loose. So it is what it is, it's my engine. If it breaks it breaks and I'll do another one but for now that's how I'm doing that one 
Um, there's some things around here that I'm going to wipe off and clean up and over here. But for the most part, uh, I think it might be ready for me to bring it down and install the flywheel and bolt up the transmission to it. All right, so here's the current game plan. So what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to clean the bell housing inside of the transmission. It's got all that uh, clutch material. Then I'm going to break out the cherry picker, lift this engine up, place it down on that piece of cardboard. Then I'm going to bring the transmission to it. I'm going to install the flywheel, torque it down, install the clutch. Once that's installed, I'm going to grab the transmission and bolt it up to the engine. And then at least that will be mated. If I have enough time, I'll probably drop the engine in the car. But if I don't, then I'll do that first thing. Well, second thing tomorrow because I have to go to a, a friend of mine's ceremony. He's getting promoted tomorrow. But uh, I'm going to clean that out and prep all of this to bolt the transmission up and install the flywheel. Alright, so as usual, whenever I take this apart, I clean it, I lube it, and I reinstall everything back. So removing the uh, throw out bearing and the fork is very simple. Literally just pull it. All right, so I'm gonna pull this out just like that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to use this rag to clean all this debris and stuff off of it. You do not want to uh, dunk this into any solvents or cleaners. All right, all you want to do is just wipe it off because if you dump any cleaners or anything on this, you will uh, remove the bearing, I mean the uh, grease from the bearing, and it will have premature failure. And this is a new, well, fairly new bearing. It feels smooth, there's no grinding, so it's still perfect. I do have a spare, but there's no need to install a new one. So, just like that, I clean it up. Remove some of the uh, lube that I, that I used last time. I believe I used the uh, anti seize last time on this and that. Over here, I used actual grease. So, to get this out, why are you being a pain? This thing usually just pops out. interesting there we go all right so same thing i'm just going to wipe this stuff down clean it up and re-lube it there's if you can see a little bit of rust in there already and this was lubed so just like the other parts i'm just gonna wipe them off it's interesting because i never had rust in here before from the uh, pivot point and the crud from the retainer spring and to install the retainer spring it's very simple all you do is the lower section goes down and then the clip goes in there which I will still remove this because I gotta put grease in there but when you install this you just literally push it on all right so now what I'm gonna do I'm gonna use this rag to pick up all the crud and debris but what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna spray this with uh it's just carburetor cleaner but I'm gonna try to get most of the crud out this bottle's almost empty so that was done.
and then just do not spray in this area you don't want this hitting that rubber seal or getting oil in there Now the stubborn areas like down here and up here, I'm going to use a, uh, a brush to loosen up that crud. And you don't want spray in there neither because there's a seal all the way at the bottom, you don't want that to get dry. Now, however clean you want your stuff to be, it's up to you. I'm just going to get the main crud out. And that's all she wrote as far as the cleaning. I'm not going to remove anything from the shaft. I'm just going to relube it. Relube that. I'm going to lube this and then install all this stuff back in here. Alright, so lubing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some grease and put it right in here. Alright. Just like so. You don't need to have that much in there. Just enough. Alright. And that right there is plenty. All right. Then what I'm going to do, all the wear parts that I see, like right here, right here, right there, right here, I'm just going to put grease on all of that stuff. But that's what the uh, where the uh, throw up bearing is going to be pushed on. on. All right. So that's this part. This part is already being used, but you can tell the wear spots right there, right there, right in here, right in here. Same thing. A little bit of grease. In there. In there. And try to dab it a little on these two spots because that's where the force is going to slide on. Alright. And on the inside. You want to get it all the way around, nice and smooth the thing is not to overdo it so that the grease doesn't fall on your uh, friction material on the disc so now what I like to do with this is just slide it on and get the uh, shaft lubed with what's already on the bearing all right, just like that, and then any excess that came off while driving that on, just wipe it off. Because, like I said, I don't want all this grease landing on the uh, on the clutch. All right. Now, another thing I want to do is to uh, lightly tab right here. And just tap it all the way around and that's just to prevent some of the wear that you'll have on the uh, on the pressure plate all right 
Once that's done, you're gonna do you're gonna grab your fork. You're gonna install it in, install it just like that. You're gonna come. Well, before I do that, your fork has got a C channel look set. You see that C? Alright, so just like that, you're going to install this on the back of the transmission if, if you don't have it already on. Make sure that the grooves is all the way around smooth, neatly. You're going to slide this through the boot first. Then, Now my boot is broken, but it still protects water from getting in here. All right, and once you have it down to that position, you're gonna lock it in, and you're gonna verify it doesn't come off, and verify that there's no nothing hindering the movement. All right, if you pay attention to my clutch disc which I will be reusing even though it's got some somewhere is that uh this stuff that's on here didn't spread out and didn't catch all over the uh, clutch which is what you want same thing with uh the back and I'm gonna show you how I lube now the uh this shaft right here. all right so because I am out of the uh the clutch lube the clutch shaft lube Mm, I messed up. Before I continue, I just noticed that uh, I didn't install the safety clip. That's why I felt weird when it went in. Yeah, messed up. Oh, good thing I caught that now. But yeah, put that back in there. When I installed it, I was like, I didn't hear no click. But then the suction on, on the uh, of the grease on the shaft was holding it in that's why it didn't come out but either way there you go now locked but no obstructions and it's holding so we're good all right put that back back to what i was saying so i'm gonna use anti-seize on this right here You do not want to overdo it. So what I'm gonna do in the in the in the front side of the shaft, I'm gonna just dab it. Because the goal is gonna be to get it, you know, nice and evenly on the splines so grabbing the disc you know, doesn't matter if it's straight or backwards you're gonna lube the shaft splines All right. now what you're gonna do is you're gonna wipe off the excess right there And you're gonna verify that you don't have any blobs, see like that right there? You don't want that. So you just wipe it off. It looks good. Like I said, you're gonna wipe off that excess from the hub and that should prevent anything from spreading over to the friction material I put this to the side it's already lubed and ready to go now we have our pressure plate on this I'm going to uh, I'm not gonna. Last time I used anti-seize on it. 
Well, this time I use grease. I wanted to see what was the spread on the anti seize last time, and it didn't spread much, but there is wear. And I don't like that wear, so I'm gonna go with grease on that. That's why I changed the way I did it. But what I do want to do is that my pressure plate is a little, little warm from slipping the clutch. I'm gonna continue slipping it, so it doesn't make sense to replace it. But I will spray some of this just to make sure the surface stays clean whatever's on there that will eat it up and the same thing with the flywheel I'm going to spray the contact surface like I said I could benefit from a new clutch and flywheel but this was still grabbing and it's holding and I slip it so it's going to look like that in a week anyway so there's no point on it now I do have a twin disc and no it is not a clutch masters um, I believe let me get this out of the way let me see how is this open now let me just pause this there it is so it's a uh, action clutch twin disc a friend of mine had bought it installed it didn't like it I don't know why I forgot what he said he had he said he had issues with it but he gave it to me to try it out and I'm gonna try it out one of these days but before I install this to try out I want to do a uh, I'm gonna do still I'm gonna do still braided uh, clutch lines because as, I don't know if I mentioned it before but this flex and I don't want this flexing with the pressure of the twin disc. I don't want to chance it. I don't want to have issues shifting right now. I just want to get the car driving. So for now, I am not going to try out that clutch. But that one will be out soon. Because I know I'm, it's, it's, on a, it's on the timer. It's, I'm going to burn it out. That's when I'll try that other one. And I'll get a hydraulic line just for precautions. And before I forget the uh, input shaft, I'm going to lube it with uh, regular grease. And yes, I understand that I put anti-seize on the threads, I mean on the uh, shaft, but there's a reason for that. And I'd rather have the dry element uh, grease on the shaft, splines versus on this right here. This is a higher temperature. Uh, stuff and trust me this is what I, how I like it so this is how I'm doing it all right all right engines on the ground and getting ready to install the transmission but first I have to do the flywheel all right so I gotta get the alignment tool from my toolbox but one thing that I was just sitting down Relaxing for a little bit, I realized that I did not adjust the valves, but they should be fine. Simply because there was no work done to the head, it was just taking off the other block and put on this one. So it should be fine. If I encounter a compression issue or something that I notice as far as loud tapping or something, then I'll address that. But it should be fine. They were adjusted like 2,000 miles ago, they'll be fine. Um, but yeah, so let me go ahead and grab that lemon tool and continue showing you guys the process. Okay, so installation of the flat was fairly simple. The tour spec for the uh, 17 mil bolts is uh, 78 foot pounds. So, just line it up. Line up the holes.
be mindful that these bolts are shorter than B series and if you install aftermarket ones you need to make sure that they're specific for a K because if not they'll bottom out and they won't be properly tightened and it, the flat will vibrate and damage the crank and you don't want that okay so what I like to do to tighten these is I use a wrench and two bolts Install a bolt on the bell housing, and when I'm tightening the uh, torquing down the flywheel bolts, it's gonna push that way. So you have to make sure that you bring the flywheel to it. Just like that. All right. Now we'll take our torque wrench. Get it calibrate real quick. All right. We'll set it to 70 foot pounds. 78. 12.17 mil socket. And we will torque it. And we're going to grab the engine and torque. I like to do a start pattern just to make sure it's down evenly. That's the last one, but I want to go all the way around just to make sure I didn't miss any. So, just remove your bolt and your wrench and take this bolt back out. Okay, installation of the crush sticks is straightforward. So, on the face of it, the Exedi Stage 1 says, uh, transmission TM side so this will face the transmission doesn't say anything on the back all right so you get your alignment tool put it in and hold it flush all right then you got to grab your uh, pressure plate and look at your uh, alignment pins Oop. So what you're going to do is line up your alignment pin and see if the other one lines up. If it doesn't, rotate. Again, lines up, perfect. So what I like to do is 
it goes up and down left and right I'm gonna try to get it close to center as possible but for now I'm going to install the bolts Now this is an aftermarket light flywheel and the reason that I went with it is because since I have a supercharger, try to lower some of the rotating mass so I wouldn't so the engine wouldn't feel too heavy. So this helped out a little bit. Alright, two more. Now the Xcedi Stage 1 clutch is, is pretty legit, eh, this engine is uh, I'll say north of 400 with the supercharger. What is the actual horsepower numbers? I don't know, I never dynoed it. But we're gonna go ahead and get this going, so let's see, like I said, it's gonna move a little, so you wanna know is see how much it moves and try to get it centered from the amount of movement that should allow your transmission to slide in smoother all right and what i'm going to do next is bring down the flywheel to where it's flush and then i'll torque it down so because everything's so i have one two three and then across one two three and so forth This is just the way I do it and the reason I do it this way is because I don't want to like flex the uh, flywheel into one direction and cause it an uneven bite. That's just me. Alright so when you fill the bottom out get ready for the torque wrench. Alright, we'll get. I know the torque pack is like 20 foot pounds, but I got an inch pound uh, 3 inch drive, so I need to convert that. So let me get that. Alright, so 240 foot uh, inch pounds. And here we go. just in case go all the way around and there we are and if this is all lined up properly it should just slide right out so just how smooth that slid out that's hopefully how smooth the transmission will slide back in all right so the first thing I did was verify that I got the right bolts in the right place. So this long one goes in the back. The other ones are already in the transmission. These two I have handy are the, the two top ones and the starters over here off to the side with the other bolt that comes through here and goes through the, uh, to the engine block. I'm going to grab the transmission and try to slide it in as, as easily as possible. And I will use the cart to hold the back end to try to keep it uh, level. And then I'll tighten everything down 
first with the impact and then I'll torque everything down. So let's get to it. Right, we're almost lined up. There we go, and from the height, I won't be able to fit the car under, so I'm just gonna continue. Okay. Now I install the starter. Just like so. You always want to start your bolts by hand. <clears throat> Should be able to get the rear one. If not, I'll do it by hand. There we go. And the starter is installed. Cool. Okay, so the transmission bell housing bolts are 47 foot pounds. So, already got my torque set up. <clears throat> okay, so transmission is torque. I'm still missing the 214s and the inspection cover and the 10, 210, uh, the 310 mil bolts. The 14s in the bottom, I'm just gonna do them good and tight. And the cover, same thing. But so right now we have an assembly that uh, I can install a wire harness on. So I'm gonna go ahead and install the wire harness. Okay, so to install the wire harness, what I like to do is I first lay it up on top of the engine like so and I just start clipping in with the uh, ignition coils <clears throat> then I'm going to do the wire on the behind the engine so VTEC pressure switch VTEC solenoid VTC crank position and last but not least oil pressure and whatever clips I still have remaining that work I just put them back on because this one right here is broken but that's a non-issue now on this side of the engine we're gonna have the rest of the wire harness and I'm gonna start working from top to bottom. So uh, evap, 
my true cam position sensors. Here a click, but it's not coming off, so it's on. Then uh, back here, we'll run this one into the engine coolant temperature. <clears throat> Going to align this up and install this section of the harness on this mounting bracket. That bolt's loose, so I need to tighten it. Now this is going to go to the ECU, so we're going to leave that alone. Now on the front side of this, we're going to have... So... Let's write this to the front. So you're going to have your speed sensor and your uh, reverse gear lockout. So... I'm going to work with the speed sensor back. I'm going to clip it, clip it, and clip it. And under, behind the shifter bracket, and uh, reverse gear lockout. And we're going to hook up the reverse light switch. Always inspect it because moisture gets in here. Mine is clean, it's got a good seal still. But be careful with that one because that one usually the cables can break because water does get in there and they get, um, what do you call it, corroded. So this will go afterwards and all of these will go afterwards because all of this is for air temp, map. Uh, I need to do something about that because it's got a little bit of corrosion inside and my fuel injectors and main ground so those are going to stay right there this goes to the charge harness so let's get the charge harness okay on the charge harness obviously a lot of these components are not going to be present so what i will do is install the uh, power Don't over tighten it because you'll break it. Slide the cover to protect it from corrosion and then your starter actuator. This one comes from the bottom up. Lock it in place. This will be your alternator, AC, your harness communication from the charge harness to the ECU. Lock it in, and this will go to your starter signal on the uh, by the battery and your battery and fuse box. All right, and last but not least, even though we're still doing wiring once this in the car, installing more components, your Dagon knock sensor. All right. Obviously, I'm doing that one last because we know how fragile it is. I do not grab the the body of it and turn on it. You want to grab the metal when you're tight when you're giving it force, and then you're gonna get your socket. I don't like how that. That's too close. Let me just remove this out of the way. All right. Give me more room for it. But you don't want to go in that angle and have the chance of breaking that sensor. So, a little snug, and that's it. There's no need to torque that thing down. Alright, and then I'm going to plug it in with the utmost respect because we've been lucky so far.
nice slow soft tug make sure it's installed and leave it alone because if you look at it wrong it'll break and then once we have the engine in the car we're going to install the alternator and plug it in and we'll install the AC compressor plug it in and finish rotting all of this other stuff for now uh, I might just drop it in the car just gonna set up move some stuff out of the way hook this up lift it and see if I can draw it in the car today alright in preparation to install the motor I'm going to install the uh, transmission side engine mount and then I will install the bracket I got this uh, fail pro exhaust manifold gasket simply because I have a little section right here these skunk two headers they're not flat they always look like crud but I already uh, try to get this flattened out but there's this little uh, spot right here I don't know if you guys can tell but uh, what happens is that the manifold will bite, the, the head will bite around here and it will allow this area to leak out. So I'm going to use this uh, gasket because uh, the material crushes and it will cover that hole and not have an exhaust leak. I had an exhaust leak up here before and trying to eliminate that little one. But hopefully this time it will seal properly I have no exhaust leaks and I will match it with the factory one. To the head because the head is perfectly flat all right and the reason that i'm talking about is this little section right here will not put pressure on that other uh cover on the manifold and what happens is it will leak through here as you can see that's what's been happening with the other gasket that i had it had a leak going coming up for, through here but the other gasket is i tossed it i'm gonna use a new one with this one and it should seal properly all right, so in the installation of the mount is fairly simple. I kept the uh, factory studs, so all I do is just slide this down. All right, and in the front, you're gonna use the grounding post with the with the nut, and on the back, I'm gonna put a washer and the other nut. Now, one thing that needs to be very important, and I'm gonna talk about, is this back bolt. All right. So you got to be careful not to go too far because if you go too far, you can crack the transmission, right? So what I like to do is I use a, a, a screwdriver and I see how long the hole, how deep the hole is. As you can see right there, it's like almost flush, like maybe one millimeter shorter. So it won't crack to the transmission. But with this bolt, uh, washer, I'll have a good clearance to protect it from... Um, breaking or cracking the case so now what I'm gonna do is tighten it down and get it ready for installation No, she's ready so when this is inside the car i will slide the uh the mount that goes on the chassis over it and bolt it down to the chassis and then slide the bolt through it all right the engine is staged up and gonna bring it in i have it tilted transmission lower so that way when i come in here the engine will be lower on the transmission side so i can install this mount and then i gotta line that up and then i'll drop down on this end after I lift up and install this bolt so the goal is to get the engine in at an angle install this bracket bring the engine up to the uh, to the mount put the bolt through it and then lower it down into this location but sliding that in at the same time if that gives me problems I might uh, take it out but for now staying in all right because of the angle that I'm coming down this was getting on my way so I removed the mount. I know I was gonna have to remove it but I was just being stubborn so I'll install it later. Moving on. Alright so I uh, lowered it right on here for an alignment point. I made sure that the header wasn't being caught and I should have enough clearance to install this uh, motor mount now so that's what I'm gonna do next. Alright so now we have to fight with this lower screw 
which I expected, but hopefully I can get it to line up. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to install by hand the two top bolts in order to maintain the bracket straight. And then I'm going to install the lower the lower bolt. Alright, because of the position that I'm in, I cannot I cannot um, get that bolt like I wanted to here. And you saw when I took this out that it was going to be a pain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just raise the motor up and put this front bolt in. And I'm going to fight it like I usually do and try to get that bolt in there and then tighten it up. the lower bolt in and I want everything loose so I'm gonna so I can install this lower bolt so I don't strip the uh, chassis uh, threads all right so what I did I by hand finger uh, the bolt in there the mount still loose but now that everything is almost flush I gotta flush in uh, bring these two down flush I'm going to uh, tighten this bracket down I think it's a uh, 54 foot-pounds but this one's gonna be good and tight because I, I cannot put a torque wrench down there so I'm gonna tighten these two and then that one now bring this up put this bolt in and then lower it into the other mount alright so I just tightened these two up and now I'm gonna do this one feels like 54 foot pounds okay so now I'm going to lift it up and get this bolt in and then I'm going to lower for the other side so let's get to it Almost. It's a little off, but it'll be fine. I'll push it in after I get the other side down. Okay. So the other side. Line it up. You ready? Going down. Yeah. Down. Down. There. 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 Now, so all the way through. And the bolt on the other side is to go from the back. From the back? Yep. Let's see if we can figure it out. <laughs> Might need to slide over a little.
Here we go. Got it in. Get that out. Uh, there we go. All right. You got to push it back first. Yeah. And line it up. And then uh, put the bolt in. Washer in there, and now the bolt, the nut. That's good. All right, so now it's held by the two top bolts, the two top mounts, I mean. And now I can um, take the engine stand out of the way and do the lower mount before anything tightens. So I got some room to wiggle and slide the lower mount in. And after that, I'll install the uh, header bolts. But at least for now, we're getting close to a stopping point for today because it's getting dark. All right, so now that the engine is in, I mean, it's not fully secured yet. It still has play. And that's what I'm going to get at. I do not want to tighten none of these bolts down yet because I need this play in order to install the lower mount and then I will start the front mount. Once everything is installed but not tightened, I will check the motor to make sure everything is in like in a neutral position and then I'll tighten down all the bolts. If you start tightening now and tightening, you start forcing the mounts, you're going to get a lot of vibrations. All right. If I'm not mistaken, my motor mounts are the, uh, the they're more than 78s. I think they're either 80 somethings or 90 somethings but they're pretty stiff they're they were the stiffest that were available at the point now they got stiffer ones but um these mounts they can make the whole car vibrate and resonate a lot so this is what i do and, and i've noticed that it stops that noise all right and got my boy right here i'm going to introduce him my boy tolilo rafi came to help me out so i was struggling so he came over they should remember because the car but uh, this is Honda content, not Tesla content. <laughs> He's talking about when we did his car. But uh, but yeah, um, I'm going to now go under and install the lower mount, get everything prepped, and then install the front mount. And then once I make sure everything's culture, I'll go ahead and tighten everything down. Okay, like I mentioned, with the uh, motor mounts loose, I got room to play down here so I can uh, slide in the uh, the lower mount. Now the question is, which way was up? Yeah, it's got scratches up here, so I'm pretty sure that's the top part. Okay. So, first, let me get situated. Hopefully, let me see. Right there. I'm going to lay these down right here. Hopefully, you can catch what I'm doing. All right. So, all right. So these motor mounts are a pain to install. Voy a empujar el motor para atrás. ¿Quieres que lo ayude? Sí, empuja para atrás. There we go. Got it. All right, she's in. So my boy Rafi, he pulled the engine, and now I was able to slide it in. So. Now I can install the rear mount bolt. Make sure it's lined up. And the front mount. And like I said, this will stay loose until I uh, install the front mount and then I'll shake the engine around to make sure everything is as neutral position as possible. So that uh, it doesn't resonate and make a lot of noise. Hopefully that video got captured, but that's the end product. All right, so I have this stubby three inch tape pack. I'm gonna go ahead and use it here. And flush. those because you can strip those and 
and I am not going to use uh, tying those to spec because I'm always afraid of, of ripple. So now we see that the engine is held pretty good and it's like in a neutral state. Now I'm going to start tightening all the bolts. So I will not record that, but I'm going to tighten this one, this one, this one, and then the one, the two at the bottom, and the engine is in. not the room the problem is that this is there's no room okay to tighten it. <sighs> okay. last one at the bottom the bottom's gonna be ooga dooga okay. All right, so the last two bolts for the mouse is this one and this one, and I'm just going to send it with the impact, and this one I'm going to give it an extra torque because this one tends to make noises when shifting and whatnot. So here we go. She wrote on the motor mounts. Here we are continuing the work. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to install now is going to be the AC compressor and the alternator. Alright, so to install the AC compressor, like I mentioned before, I just left it hanging right here. All you have to do is bring it up to the this these little hooks right there and then slide the bolts in and lock it in it's fighting me a little bit but it'll be fine I'll get it in there just the way that I have my hose routed in order for me to have because I bet all of this um, it makes it hard to install but it's, it's not gonna be that hard so I'm gonna place the uh, the, the bottom on the top hooks right here and then we'll start the four bolts and bolt it up. All right, here we go. So now that I got two hands, I can get it lined up. And the top bolts are the longest ones. So there's two long and two short. So you're gonna use your uh, longer bolts at the top just to get it started as quickly. So now I'm going to turn them all the way down. <clears throat> Through the bottom, you need to just use an extension to reach the bolts. <clears throat> and 
and now that the AC compressor is installed, you can grab the wire harness and plug it in. Next I'm going to do is the alternator. Alright, to install the alternator, it's basically almost the same as installing the uh, AC compressor. But what I did is I got the uh, three bolts already installed. The top one will slide and hold. it will hold the alternator in place. So, just like that. Also, all you have to do now is just make sure you line up the bottom ones. and get them started. And then once they're started, just tie them down. Need an extension on that one. Simply because the AC line is on the way. And there you go. Side. Now, it's a little clippy right here. You know, lock your harness back down. You know, plug in the electrical connector and install your power wire. 10 mil, slide the sleeve back, slide the uh, wire through the stud, and then tighten it down. <coughs> and then once your wire is installed, reinsert your boot to protect it from the elements. Alright, the next thing I'm going to be installing is the uh, ECU bracket. So, it's got this bolt down here that will mount right there. This hole right here that will mount right up here. And this 10 mil that will mount behind the fuse bus back here. So, just like before, I'm going to just move this out of the way. Get the uh, clutch line also out of the way. And then I'm going to install this bracket. Okay, so first I'm going to grab the uh, clutch line and get it out of the way. Then I'm going to, there's two clips back here. Push back and lift. And now the computer, I mean sorry, the fuse box is out of the way. Now I'm going to line up the bracket. Going to install the two, I think these are 14s. And the 10 mil. Now I'm going to tighten them down. Extension. <coughs> This accessible right there, all right. So we'll bring the ECU over and the harness. Gotta slide it right between this spot right here. Just be careful not to damage anything. Oh. There we go. All right. Try to force it up a little bit. Now we can install, I start with what's in the front and line up the rear and then just lock it down. Alright, the next, the next step I'm going to take is going to be installing the uh, power cable. The power cable goes to the computer 
and after I install that there then I'm going to install my grounds down here all right and I'll go over those so the first thing is going to be is the power wire to the ECU I mean sorry the fuse panel fuse box you gotta remove your your two screws and this only goes in one way all right it's got a little uh, a clip here and a spot over here so you gotta line it up properly and get it in there but right now my camera's on the way so I gotta move it okay so like I mentioned this needs to be slid a certain way into this And right there is being held by the clip here and the spot right up here. Now you guys install the two screws. Okay. And then you just install the cover and we're done here. Alright. Now we're going to go to the ground. Alright, so to install the ground, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run this wire, which is going to go from my battery ground, and then this is going to be my, uh, the factory ground connection, and I have a piggyback going to the, uh, to the frame rail. Just so I can ensure I have a good ground connection. Now installing this screw is a pain for me because of the way I have it set up, but once it's started, it'll go right in. There we go. Alright, you don't want to overtime because this is not very strong. And if you ever strip this, you can put a nut under it and tighten it down. So that's your ground wire. Now this is your starter signal wire. Wire. Uh, once I run these wires, and because I'm trying not to clear this air right here, I'll plug this in. But if you don't plug this connector in, your vehicle will not crank. All right. Just an FYI. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, skip that for now because I need the alternator in place in order to uh, to install this the wiring harness on this corner because I want to route it a different way. And after I do that, uh, then I should be moving on into uh, installing the axles and header and whatnot. But for now, before I install the radiator, I'm just going to put my uh, my valve cover, uh, coil pack cover on. And then I'm going to install the radiator. Okay, installing the cover is just simple. All right? uh, dang, that's scratches all over it now. I have others. I'll swap it out later, but for now, I'm just gonna put it on. So, we got the special key bolts in the back. And the regular uh, covered nuts in the front. Now I'm going to drop in the radiator. All right, so here's my radiator. So I'm going to slide it down behind the alternator. I mean the uh, the AC condenser and be and in front of the engine. And you have these uh, bushings at the bottom. You gotta make sure you line up these bushings properly because if you don't, see how this one is crushed. All right. So I will make sure this one's aligned properly when I install it. And then I'll put in the uh, upper tie downs and bolt everything up. So like I said, you just gotta put the two uh, 
bushings into the uh, lower radiator support and then bring your lower hose over to your thermostat and your upper radiator hose now I'm going to do my wiring but before that I will install the clamp on the lower hose I won't record that, that should be self-explanatory and I will make sure my bushings are in the correct spots and I continue to wire it up alright so what I did was I installed the hoses except for this one because this is what I'm going to do to bleed the air out of the, uh, the cooling system I uh, routed the uh, wires the way I was talking about behind everything this is right here it's gonna be hooked up to the battery so that's not gonna be an issue but all my wires come to the front instead of behind this bracket because I didn't like the wires being pinched right here so I ran the wires through the front of this beam and around here I had to extend one wire but now I, I'm, I'm much happier with with that right there and I ran the wiring for my fans both of them this is for the hood prop and um, my water temperature sensor at the radiator on the bottom right here and since I ran all the wires to the front I got my horn my air intake temperature sensor and then the wire that I extended is this one going to the ABS sensor so you know now I'm going to uh, hook up my uh, my uh, cooling system for my supercharger which I won't record but it's very basic it's just a hose coming out from the top to my reservoir a hose coming from the bottom to my water pump and then it circulates and does this thing and I also installed my belt and this ground right here so I'm going to finish installing my uh, I'm going to drop the battery in there I'm going to hook up the positive and the ground tie and put the battery tie down which are self-explanatory so I'm not really going to go over that and then I was, I'm going to install the cross brace the top braces I got to remove this bungee from the header because it's already uh, it's just been hanging there I got it and then I'm going to install the bolts on the header and then the axles and front bumper is done so let's continue okay so I installed my battery I tightened up my hose clamps for my uh, supercharger cooler and tighten up all the hoses so all of that's done so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to install the uh, radiator upper support alright to install the radiator support you just gotta slide it down and you're gonna have your uh, AC condenser uh, bushings make sure they don't get caught and you're going to slide your upper uh, radiator bushings into the two pins and this you got to push it out of the way so they can go over top of this right so let's do it I'm going to plug in the uh, hood prop, uh, well the hood uh, sensor, the latch. If you leave this undone, your alarm will not activate. Okay. Just got to make sure your wiring is not going to get hit by the uh, fan blades. Alright, now that that's installed, I'm going to install the hardware. So when you install your hardware, you, you don't want to tighten anything down. You just want to install all your bolts where they go because you want to be able to have some play. If you if you tighten everything down one by one, you're going to run into a, a chance that some bolts may not line up and you may strip your uh, the holes on the set on this brace. Um, yeah, 
<clears throat> Usually I leave this undone because when I'm filling up, if you tilt it back, it will let air out, but I got the only thing on there, so I shouldn't have that problem. One thing that I forgot to do is install this cable on it, but I know how to do it with it like that, so it'll be fine. I suggest that if you don't do your latch, do it first because it can be a pain. Last one back here. Let's use a little. Alright. And some cross brace is installed now. I'm going to booger this into place. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fill up my radiator. And like I mentioned, I'm going to leave this hose undone. And you'll see why in a minute. <clears throat> so basically what that is undone is allowing the system to be open and it allows the uh, coolant to fill both sides of the uh, engine and radiator so you don't have to worry about wait for the thermostat to open and it needs to open it needs to have fluid in it if it has no fluid and it won't open it won't circulate and you'll have that uh, bubble in there and it won't uh, properly function well it's the next day and uh, even though we did get the car started last night and we were experiencing the dead battery issues and whatnot I left the uh, battery charging overnight hopefully it'll come back if not I'll just get another one this that battery is pretty old and you know the car did sit for a while but um yeah still haven't bled finished bleeding the uh, cooling system so what i'm going to do is uh, i'm going to go ahead and install the the front bumper all the clips the covers and the spindle uh axle nuts the wheels i'm going to drop it down and pull it outside once it's outside I'm going to tilt the entire car in an angle and uh, try to see if I can get the air out of the system. All right, I've done that before successfully with this hose undone, and it works. It, it you know, nine times out of ten, I, I'll do it the way I'm talking about. And even though I was able to get a lot of air out of it, there, it there's still air because it's not the thermostat doesn't seem to be opening properly. So it may I may have a bad thermostat, but I do know that if you have that infamous freaking air pocket in here, it just will not freaking f work and flow properly. So I'm gonna get ready, get to it, and get this ready so we can start driving it. Okay, so since the battery's been charging all night with my little it's a battery tender that I have for my motorcycle. But it's dual voltage, 6 and 12, and it works fine, so hopefully, like I said, 
it brought the battery back. If not, I'll get, I'll get another one. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and put down the battery protector, which is very important, especially if you relocate your battery, because you don't want nothing touching that battery uh, positive terminal and arc out and damage some something. So that's one. I will install my reservoir. Best I'm gonna get with that, and then I'm just gonna run this little hose to the side right there so that it can do its thing. I would try rather make sure there's no pins on it because it does have a bend. The proper thing to do would be to cut this hose and make it just go straight but my, the problem that I've seen of doing that before is that then the hose will be too short so when you undo this uh, cap you cannot slide out the, the tube completely out of the reservoir. I much rather not have to go through that. So because I don't like the angle and pinch looking that I have when I turn it around bring it towards the back side there are no more kinks and reinstall okay so that's my reservoir now i'm going to install my intake and there we go and i like to make sure that my wiring and the way this intake is installed is not binding against everything or anything and it's to my accessible tolerances I'm going to go ahead and tighten it down like I mentioned before all I did was buy the parts and I made my own intake I believe the website was called frozenboost.com and you can order the pipes by sizes, the elbows by sizes and uh, angles and even step downs or whatever but you know it's, it's been flowing. I have seen 22 PSI out of my current setup so my filter and intake they're not restricted at all because if I take it off I have the same PSI so it works perfect. Uh, okay so that's done. Let's move on to the spindle nuts. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to start the wheel. Now, currently, I'm running my Mug factory Mugen GP wheels <coughs> with um, Continental Extreme Contact Sports. And the size are. 235 40 and um, they barely rub a little bit, but they're fine. <clears throat> Whenever start installing your wheels. Make sure that your wheels flush and at least get one lug nut tightened all the way. That way when you uh, tighten your your wheel down, it's not at an angle and it would uh, damage the, uh, the seat of the wheel and then because it will cause your wheel to be hard to remove and so forth. And just like the spin, the uh, the nut, I will uh, torque the wheels, the tires afterwards. And I torque my wheels to 100 foot pounds. That's my choice. That's not what the book says. All right. On to the other side. <clears throat> right, so just 
take the other side. Like I mentioned, you want to make sure that at least one lug nut is flush. And I like to keep the uh, lug nut at the bottom to be the flush one. That way it doesn't just tilt outward, the wheel that is. And the rest I just get them started. And I ooga dooga them at first and then later on I torque them. So the front bumper is easy self-explanatory so all I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the bumper up to it we'll make sure that the lip of the bumper is you know it's right on here so you can slide and lock in and I'm going to make sure I don't scratch my corners and then push the two corners in I'll line up all the plastics and then I'll start all the fasteners and at the end I'll remove the tape off the headlights one thing I want to add before I continue installing the bumper is that if you have something like this type of intake, right, where it's on the way, you want to make sure that your filter is as far as head as forward as possible so that it doesn't push back against your fender liner. So what I like to do is I line up the, uh, you can probably can't see it, but I line up the hole and I see if, it's, if I got clearance behind the filter, I'm good to go. If I don't, then I need to loosen everything up and try to adjust it towards where it will be forward as much as it can allowing this to be forward enough not to be pushed back so that the tire doesn't eat it and so you can install your clips back properly so like I mentioned you're going to grab your fender liner you're going to line it up behind the bumper and then you just going to lock it in just like that all right. <clears throat> All right. So the lower cover. What I'm going to do is, this goes between the uh, the bumper and the the flame rail. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide that into place, right? And then these little clips right here on the sides is what's gonna hold it up for me to put all the clips in. So I'm gonna slide these two in first and. Then slide this into the right position under it, and then I'll install all the clips. Okay, here we go. So, like I mentioned, you got the two side clips. So, we're gonna get this in there and push the first clip in. That's gonna hold it up for you. And the other side. I'm gonna push that clip in also and now this needs to go between the bumper and the lower radiator support just like so okay so this is what it should look like so it's under the fender right but over the bumper so when you put this clip right here you're gonna grab those three things together right there all right so like it's between the bumper and the lower radiator support all right and all your clips should go in just fine if if you install this correctly now i'm gonna install my clips okay like i mentioned before always inspect your clips and the 
how I'm going to install these is I have the regular uh, clips and I have the ones that have the uh, little metal uh, ears that come out so the ones that have the metal ears I'm going to use those for the sections where it's three sections of three pieces of plastic together because this will hold way better everything together and the non uh, little metal ears ones they're going to go straight into the uh, the chassis or subframe or radiator support whatever you call it and like I mentioned if you if you have these and they're broken just get some a bag of a hundred of them for like they're cheap if they break you just keep replacing them unless you have enough all right where's my metal one <clears throat> Perfect. And then I don't have a metal one for here, so I'm going to grab one and another one over here. But the under section is all now uh, done. Now we need the plastic to the subframe. Done. And now I'm going to get two clips for the two corners and I'm going to do the uh, sides and then the plastic covers are all done. Alright, when, <clears throat> when you install these, when you install these right here, make sure that uh, this rubber, uh, I don't know what you would call this, but this little rubber lip is lined up so that you catch the bumper, the rubber lip and the fender liner. That way everything is nicely secure down here. This one just holds the, uh, the the liner. It doesn't like hold anything else. The hole the top is bigger, so don't worry about that one. Make sure once again that these three are holding everything together, and the rest that all your uh, provisions for installing any of these are installed. Now I'm going to do the two sides, and um, yeah, probably drop the car and drive it out. Okay, so on the sides you have that clip back here. And this one over here in the front, and the this part goes over the fender liner, all right. And then you slide it in through the into the chassis and so forth. Always inspect for all your other clips if they're not there. Put one in because you don't want this flapping. You don't want the tire catching it, ripping it apart. But you know, these are my already you know from factory fender liners, and they're all still intact. So if you take care of them, they'll last. Okay, so we're going to try to get the air out of it now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lift the driver's side up and tilt, basically tilt the motor. And then uh, I'm going to open this hose right here and try to get the air out. And hopefully you guys can see when the, when the uh, bubbles come out and or the uh, fluid level goes down. Alright, so I'm going to start. Okay, now we'll try to see if I can open that, uh, that hose. I don't know if you guys can see, but you guys get the point. Just tightening the hose. All right, so now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start the car and let it uh, idle and do its thing and hopefully the thermostat opens and it works as it should.
So what I'm going to be looking for is for the uh, upper and lower radiator hose to get warm. And when the, when the coolant gets hot, my, my level should rise a little bit. When the fans kick on, it should drop down. That's going to tell me that the system's working properly. So that's what we're going to look for. And hopefully this time we get it. And if not, I'm going to have to, have to be replacing that thermostat. So far, I haven't, I haven't seen any check engine lights. All pressure is good. Everything's working as it should, except for the, uh, the infamous cooling that these uh, engines tend to have as far as being bled properly. But like I said, hopefully this works. If it doesn't, then I'm just gonna be replacing the thermostat and starting from scratch. All right, so right now it's been idling for, I would say about 15 minutes and the fans haven't kicked on yet. So I'm assuming that the uh, thermostat may have opened and the temperature staying at our operating temperature. It hasn't gotten hot enough yet to uh, kick on the fans. Last night, it kicked on the fans within like five minutes. And I could feel that the lower hose was cooler than the top hose, so the water wasn't circulating. Right now I'm about to check the uh, lower radiator hose to see if it's gotten any warm and um, see if we're actually getting somewhere. Woo! The uh, lower radiator hose is hot. So I believe the thermostat may have opened We'll see once the fan kicks kicks on because if, when the fan kicks on, the uh, the temperature, the uh, water level will drop. You guys understand thermodynamics: hot expands, cold contracts. So when the radiator gets cooled by the fans, the water will contract, your level will go down, and that's how I know that the system's operating as it should. All right, here you see the uh, cooling going down. Like I said, the fan just kicked on. And this is the, uh, the tenth cycle. Now that it has done this successfully a couple times, I know that uh, my cooling system is working as it should. I don't know if you can tell, but the level is going down as the cool as the uh, water temperature goes down. The levels is uh, lowering, which tells me that my thermostats are opening as they should. My cooling system is uh, cooling as it should and everything is working you see it's just sucking down the the, uh, the coolant and now because it's going to start getting warm it's going to expand i'm just going to remove this install the cap and go on the test drive So during my test drive, I'm just gonna be on the lookout for overheating to make sure everything's fine. And when I'm done with my test drive, I'm gonna make sure that this hose is tight because it can leak from right here. We don't want that. So now I'm gonna go drive it. Had a successful slash uh, failure on the first initial drive. So engine wise, transmission, everything that I did was running perfect. Drove about 11 miles and then the car started to sputter and it died. So I, if, if, it seemed to be a few problems. So I took my injectors to get cleaned up and they were clogged. So with the injectors being clogged, that tells me that the factory fuel system uh, filter may, uh, should maybe disintegrated and it clogged my fuel injector. So I'm going to be uh, fixing my fuel system here. 
to get the car back up and running. But as far as the engine swap is concerned, I mean the engine replacement, good to go. As far as my fuel system, so a little bit more content I guess I'll be adding to the video, but here we go. I started to install the fuel rail, got the injector set up, my, and then my fuel line started, you know, of putting starting fittings and cutting hoses and installing them. Made a bracket for my uh, fuel pressure regulator. Got the fuel pressure regulator macked up because this is not the one I'm using. This is the one from my other car, but I don't want to scratch the new one, so I'm using this older older one. And did this line right here by having uh, sized and cut it because I ran into a little small problem. The uh, tube right here that I'm using as my return, I was planning on using this. Which it would have been fine, however, it doesn't stay. Why? Because I ordered, I've had the wrong size. I need a quarter inch adapter and this is a 5 16th. So even though it's a 6 NPT, it is the wrong diameter and size so it won't seal. So I just ordered a new one so while we wait for that, I will continue to do other stuff. Hello everyone, quick update. So. I finished installing my fuel system. I tried the car and it was misfiring still. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, I went and because I've experienced this before, I went and I replaced my uh, O2 sensor with one that I keep on hand, which was brand new. Now the one in here is the used one, but apparently it's still good because it still did the same thing. And then I experienced this problem, similar problem before where it was misfiring and it was my... Uh, Oh, uh, map sensor. Well, when I unplugged the map sensor and I looked at the connector, I don't know if you guys won't be able to tell, but ah, it fell out. But the pin was broken and it was in there. It's a good thing they came out, but when I grabbed a uh, little uh, mirror to look in there, the middle pin is broken, so that's the problem. Well, new sensor time. Okay, current progress on the fuel system. So the fuel rails installed, all the lines are done, the fuel pressure regulator is installed, the uh, fuel filters installed. I made a little bracket there for it. Made a bracket for the fuel regulator. And I have a, a primary fuel filter there, simply because my hose was too short and I didn't feel like buying more. So I added a filter to it. And here's my, uh, the good filter. And there's the uh, hookup back there for the factory line for a return. Back here, here's my uh, fuel system setup. I'm gonna leave everything exposed because I'm looking for leaks. I'm going and I still haven't done the wiring. When I do the wiring, I'll show that. But for now, we're looking Gucci for to test drive. The car started uh, yesterday, so we're good to go today. I had a problem with the map sensor that's fixed. So here we go. So now that all of that has been dealt with and the car is finally running, we're going to go ahead and get this thing finalized and put, finish putting it back together, all right? So <clears throat> if you can appreciate the inside of that, which may be a little hard, but you can probably see that... Um, the little middle pin is broken. So, <clears throat> this is what caused my issue with the car shutting off. Somehow the pin on this broke. I don't really know how. Because this is the first time i ever seen a sensor break like this. I'm not going to fault on data for that. Because it could have just been a manufacturer defect or anything like that. You know, things happen. I don't see how installing the pin, I mean the uh, connector will break that pin. But this is what broke, and since I've never experienced that, it threw me on a loop. That's why I was thinking that it was probably my, because uh, this obviously also controls fueling. So that's what I was thinking, okay, what controls fueling? Well, my, my O2 sensor controls fueling. And instead of pulling out my scanner and reading the data, I just replaced it. And after I did that, and I was like, wait a minute, I had a sensor go out on me, and it did something similar. And the problem with that sensor was that it was just, it was reading, but reading like completely different pressure. So it had like gone out of tolerance somehow. But 
the uh, sensor that went bad you know I swapped it out with this one and the car was running fine since and even though this is technically still a good sensor it just won't read because that pin is broken so I'm gonna keep this and eventually I might just cut this around and solder three wires through each pin and then use it on a different car with you know a modified harness because we don't let things go to waste around here. <clears throat> okay. So, um, I already gave a brief explanation of, of what I did with the fuel system. All right. It's hooked up. And uh, I still need to modify the wire harness because the pump is too strong for the wiring. But for now, I'm going to test the car and worry about upgrading the wiring later. It'll be fine. It's not going to die overnight. So, what going to do continuing is uh, finishing the installation uh, this is this con uh, current clip I've been waiting to get to this point uh, on the videos that I was making or and this one and I don't know if you guys noticed that during uh, I mean you obviously did if you watch the videos but there's some steps missing and the reason the steps are missing is because uh, my, com my computer had an issue uh, it was Cost by me, but the computer's old, and it's why it caused my issue. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I by mistake deleted like the main folder where I was keeping all these clips. And let me tell you, it took it took a lot of effort to retrieve the uh, these files. I was able to retrieve, I think it was like a hundred and ninety-seven clips, but I still lost about. 30 to 40 maybe and it was the installation of the oil pump uh, installation of the head cam and rocker assembly installation of the supercharger uh, installation of the intake installation of the fuel rail uh, installation of the axles and I may be missing a couple other things that I that I need to mention but uh, it's irrelevant. The, the point is that now I'm getting to finish the car. This car's going to require a tune. It's still, it's still going to be able to drive, but it's going to drive a little rich. Because I've been looking at the, uh, the AFRs and they're a little rich. And the reason that they're a little rich, you know, I think it's like almost 1% rich, uh, you know, more fuel than it should be while driving and idling and coasting. And that is simply because... If you guys saw in the video when I was pointing out that uh, the actual feed, the stock line, is very small. And when you compare the diameter of, the, of that stock line to something like this, this is way bigger. Right? And <clears throat> I'm delivering way more fuel to my fuel rail right, than before by volume. By pressure, however... I lowered the pressure from because I couldn't control the pressure before. I just had a few uh, crushed fuel pressure regulator. I uh, lowered my my PSI would be between 60 to 65, which is fine for these injectors. They can handle it. So I just had the car tuned to that pressure and you know all the stuff that went on. But the, the fuel wasn't let's just call it it wasn't enough. But now I have more fuel volume. And because it was so rich in the beginning, what I did is I grabbed the fuel pressure regulator regulator. And I lowered it because I set it to the original pressure to try and maintain things the same. But I lowered the uh, pressure to about 55. So now, and I have more than enough fuel. And if something happens when I'm with my boy tuning the car, what we'll do is that we'll at that point either raise or lower the pressure some more if we having issues and wonky fuel tables. But that's here or there. Uh, like I said, the car still requires a tune. So now what I'm going to do is continue to the last couple steps for the you know complete removal and complete restoration of all the components that are for this particular uh, project so installation of the middle front uh, radiator support cover it's, it's very simple but if you don't do this current steps you're gonna you're gonna experience you know hardship so 
but try to explain it as best as possible because this applies to all the AFGs. So you first have to get your uh, your lever release through the hole, right? Uh, because of how much lower it is, and then you have this on the way. What I like to do is that I just bend it, right? So lift this up, get it started, bend it upward, and slide it through, right? Once you have slid this in, then you have to slide the front uh, lip into the uh, the bumper. While you, after you do that, you need to install, uh, slide this little lip under the fender and this other lip under this cover, all right? So I will start first by pushing the lip into the uh, into the bumper, all right? So if you saw how I bent it, the reason I bent it the way I did was to make sure I don't hit this corner of the fender and scratch it, all right? And then once I get this corner started, I'm gonna bring it in the rest of the way, just like so. And then on this corner, I'm gonna bend it up, I'm gonna bend it down and slide it in. Same thing, trying to get it under this fender, all right? So once you get to this point, you should have this lip in the corner under the fender. You should have this lip under the uh, bumper all the way through and then under this other uh, fender over here. Now, this little leg, with this disconnected here and here, you can move this back and slide it under. Now, if I had this pin, in, uh, this clip in, then I would just bend it and slide it under over here, this piece. But now that that's lined up, same thing with this other side. This side only has usually has one clip over here, so it's easier always to just slide back and forward and put that under. Now you're gonna get grab your clips and put them on. So it's being pushed up. So let's see. I think it's this AC one. Make sure you line up your your uh, your filler neck and your know, trim piece, all, so you can catch all three uh, things right there. And now this corner. There we go. It's locked in. Uh, I just move the hose a little bit to allow this plastic to slide down a little bit better and there it is and then for uh, the outside I think on this one right here and for the other side same thing and this is this side is easier so you just put the pin in and the last two things are going to be this clips I got four here yep these are the ones I was looking for when I was doing the under cover but either way uh, just like so and that's the uh, this bottom piece right here all right starting to look like an engine bay all right so this is that uh, metal brace that goes on the between the two strut towers all right and I mentioned it in the beginning of the video well in the earlier in the video I think it was part one when I was taking this apart um, you see this this is an structural piece a lot of people take this off and i'm like why but if you see this corner right here uh bolts down and that corner to your strut tower tops all right so if you go and see how everybody installs sway bars i mean upper braces i mean that's exactly what that piece does it adds rigidity between the two strut towers and also it covers the bottom to give, you know, to, to channel the airflow downward so they can escape the engine bay, right? Taking that off does two things negatively, right? It takes away that rigidity from the, uh, the top tower and it takes away some of that aerodynamic efficiency to push the heat out of the engine bay and essentially what you're doing is you're going to have airflow going to your radiator into your engine bay and into your uh into your cabin right so i mean if you live in a cold place and you want this radiant heat to go into your cabin i guess it'll work but when you're running the car and you have your ac blowing the last thing you want is heat going into your cabin and you know making your ac not work as efficient so without further ado, let's go ahead and 
So it's gonna be those two bolts in that corner. Then you got this little one right here. That's our 10 mils here, back there, center, over there, same thing on that side. And then obviously when we put the cover, uh, I'll explain that. So let's go ahead and uh, get that piece installed. I think that should be good information to know about that piece. So just like the removal process, you're gonna wanna go in at an angle because you got these uh, plastic covers, right? And if the plastic covers are like tied out with clips, you cannot just flat this in straight as you can see, it'll just catch, right? So you gotta go in that angle and get that this little lip past the front part. And then the other side, just side angle. There we go. It's giving me problems. I was like, that looks like giving me problems. By the way, <clears throat> now we get our hardware. We're gonna start with the two top. Like like I said in previous other sections, never tighten a bolt until everything's installed. So, reason for that is, I'm installing these two 12 mils, for example, right? And if if it's too far to the right, it will not be centered on that hole. And when you go try to install your your 10 mil, for example, it it see how it won't go in straight. It'll go in at an angle. You don't want that. So if you straighten it or line it up center the hole now the 10 mil is straight and it goes in by hand if i were to tie in these and this was all centered what's going to happen is that the metal is going to damage the, the the threads on the screw and then the threads on the screw are going to damage the uh, threads on the chassis and then you're going to have a strip situation here and you don't want that you want to prevent that so <clears throat> go ahead and finish installing the hardware I said, if, if any any time you're installing anything and it feels like you're forcing it, then something's wrong. Reset, start over. Now, the three in the back can be a pain because you know your hands not gonna fit really good in there, and you can drop your hardware. So what I like to do is that I grab a ten mil with the extension. I install the uh, screw on the. Uh, on the socket and that middle one back there let me see so you guys can let me show you guys i don't know if you can make it up but you see that the metal shield is lower so you're gonna have to tilt it up to get the uh the hole to line up properly right and once again that's why i said leave everything loose so that you can move things around and install your hardware because now i can center it and then lower it and then i'll have a clear passage through through the hole but when my when I have this in there I'm gonna use my hand to tilt this down and then I'll be able to reach into that hole and not strip it Once all your hardware is installed, all right, like I said, I like to make sure everything is centered. So I will left and right and try to keep the, the movement to the middle and then I'll start tightening. I will start with that back one first. Now we're going to install the cover. Okay, so installing your uh, little trim piece on top right here. Before you install it, you want to just do a couple checks, right? So you want to make sure that all your clips are there and not broken. This one has a crack piece right here, but it still works. So I'm going to leave it alone. I could replace it, but I'm, I'm not. You know, uh, when you're installing this piece, it's, it's always hard 
to do but right here is the little area to hook up your 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 hose right so i'm not going to worry about installing this little hose on that retainer because it's really hard once all of that's installed all right uh you want to check your clips right here make sure they're not broken you know check everything else same thing with this side make sure that these clips right here are not broken and then you're going to check the two side covers same thing you're going to do is see that these two holes are not broken there with this one that one goes to this piece right here all right and same thing with this one you want to make sure these are not broken if they're broken you can always just go to a honda website and order either this or those which i did on my coupe i replaced the whole panel because it had gotten weathered and on removal it cracked so now this is a trick that i do to install this the first thing i do is this little cover right here i remove it and you'll see why i remove this little covers in a second so what i do is i reach under and there's a tab on i put and i push in and it lifts lifts off so i'm pushing this tab right here inward because this other side is just a catch this side is the uh the area that actually grips all right so when you put it on you put that side on first and then you push down but you remove that and now i'm going to explain why I remove those two round covers because they have a purpose. So, to install this piece, <laughs> something that I just noticed, I never noticed before, is that it literally says blue clip right here. And that's where the blue clip, clip goes. And the reason for that is because this one is basically round and the rest are flat. And if you see on the, uh, on the car itself, you see that all of these are slanted holes, right? Except for that one that is round. So you got those slanted ones and round one. By the way, I just found that interesting that I just noticed that. So anyways, first thing we're gonna do is hook up our uh, windshield washer fluid hose. Just gonna grab it. Slide it in. And then, like I said, I'm not going to worry about trying to slide that cable, uh, tube into that clip right there because, I mean, I take this off a lot. And the last thing I want to do is break stuff. Then I'm just going to simply line it up on, on the corners of the uh, other, other trim. All right. And installation, this is how I do it. So I'm going to bang right here. All right. And then I'm going to reach my hand under inside that hole. I'm going to push down those two other tabs. Now it's properly secured all right same thing i'm going to do on the other side line it up up it down and lock them in now it's nice and flush and then the rest of the section right here i'm just going to tap down all right <clears throat> and if you guys own one of these cars you guys know that these things dry out so this one while it's been in the garage i had uh put some trim dressing on it to try to get it to soak up, soak up the uh, soak in the, the it's like a protector slash um, yeah, make it brighter that way it doesn't just look gray or silver whatever not, not silver but it doesn't look gray and let me see if I find there we go I found it This is what I just tried on it, and it seems to be pretty legit so far because I used it on my Ford and it's been holding up. Just in case you guys want to try it. No, I'm not selling you guys products, I'm just sharing what I use. Alright, because it looks pretty good. And we'll see how long it lasts once I'm driving because this one is, you know, faded. Anyway, um, then you got your three clips. Now, this middle one is always the problem one. Sometimes they don't want to go in or they just break all the time, but that was there. And like I've been mentioning, if these things break, I mean, you can sit down on eBay and just type in like uh, Honda retainer clips. Look at the images and you see the ones that you need 
you can click on them and just buy them and then you know I buy them in bulk usually they cost between three dollars all the way to like ten dollars and you have a, a whole bunch of them and if they break you just throw in a new one all right now this cover just it's real simple and just like that they're on all right so I can literally say that the job is done there is one thing I need to install but for the most part Ta-da! The job is done. Now for you, those of you that are going to say, what about the windshield wiper blades and all this other stuff? I get it. Yes, they're right here. They're not installed. However, you notice I don't have wiper blades. Reason for that is, uh, my brother came to visit for the 4th of July. And he has a new gun like me. And if you guys see my other video that I posted, um, I went over his car, he had like some issues with it and he had to take it to a shop and oh my god did they do a horrible job in his car so I took most of the stuff that they did off and reinstalled it except for the clutch itself. Um, he had a broken pedal, they, they told him they put in a new one, they did not put a new one through here. They welded it, I don't know if you guys can see, let me see, yeah. yep, yeah they welded it horribly. It was not straight. It was hitting the, it was hitting the firewall, and the car was making all the freaking noises that everybody complains online about, as far as enga uh, engagement on the clutch pedal. You guys want? I did a uh, a video on that, as far as like how to minimize and how to properly lube and how to properly install your clutch pedal and lines so that uh, it doesn't make all those noises. But either way, because he was here. And he had just gotten uh, back into country. He's in the army. Um, his wiper blades were weathered and broken, and he was about to continue to visit more, more, more friends and families. And his wiper blades were done. So I just took him off my car, put on his, and told him, "Here you go, my little brother. I'm gonna take care of him." So that's what I did for him. And so I'm not going to install my wiper blades. I'm just gonna keep them in the trunk. And if I uh, Stop by a parts store, I'll grab some wiper blades and cinch them down real quick and boom, I have a uh, wiper blade. Another thing I need to do is that, uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but my windshield is cracked. Right there in the middle and now even though you cannot see it, this little hit right here, the split goes all the way towards the, uh, the mirror holder. So I need a new windshield, which is a shame because... This was an original, I don't know if you can see it right here, an original Honda windshield that I've been always working to not damage my windshield. But on my road trip back from uh, Missouri, I uh, there was a truck on the road. I saw it, it had a whole bunch of mud on it, you know, because some people like to do their, you know, their off-road thing. And I was like, yo, there was, I, I saw a little like chunks of dirt flying off of it. And I'm like, let me just get away from this car. Because I don't want a rock to damage my car more than what already it is. And sure enough, as I was getting, passing him, um, it, I saw the rock just hit the ground and then, bow, hit my windshield and it cracked it. And before that rock hit my windshield, a lot of the debris that came off of his car, also freaking like, this thing was filthy, man. And, and since I was being peppered when I was driving behind him, I just decided to pass them and I already had a lot of damage on my paint from what was coming off that guy's truck yeah you see like it was just horrible so you know to add insult to injury to all the damage it did to my front end boom got my windshield because I mean I had rock ships already on it I'm not gonna be like oh he did all this there was some there but he did like the big ones like you can just see how big those things were the paint is just cracked up and so I did get this car resprayed but not 1000% and what I mean by that is that uh, the front end the nose the fenders was done by Honda the roof was done by Honda and the top of the trunk was done by Honda but they never when there was the paint recall but they didn't pay, paint the whole car so with time my uh, quarter panels 
and my doors and the bottom half of my trunk started to fade and the paint was falling off. So I took it to my, where my brother lives in Georgia and he knew a shop there that was a decently priced and I wasn't looking for perfection. I was just looking for the car to look good and that's what they did. They made my car look good. They didn't make it look perfect. So since I do plan in the future to eventually remove everything from the outside, take it to a proper shop and have it properly uh, body worked and cleaned up and then repainted properly. At that point, I will install my front lip, which I have a new one in the box because these are discontinued. Because this one, I uh, I had to talk to somebody and I pulled to the side of the road and there was a huge pothole and I just landed in it. And so, yeah, it's a little loose. I could take this off and tape it back down right here so it's staying better, but the lower bracket is best. So I got to bend it up so it can push up. But for now, this is repairable and I'll probably try to get it fixed when I get the car painted. But if it doesn't look too good, I'm just going to put the new lip on. Alright. So now that this is put together, I am not going to install the back seats and the fuel pump cover. And the reason for that is because I'm monitoring my wiring. So yeah, like I said, I'm monitoring this wiring. Alright. Because this wiring is weak for the fuel pump. So I'll be like touching it and seeing if it's getting uh, hot, seeing if it's starting to melt anything. Because at that point, I'll just stop driving the car and that's when I'm going to go ahead and install my uh, the wiring upgrade. But for now, you know, I'm going to see how long it takes for this to start giving me issues. Yeah, call it what it is. I'm just, that's how I like to do things. I like to, you know, research, but I like to verify. And I'm also keeping an eye on my fuel line, making sure it's not leaking. It hasn't yet, it's good. And this is now the return instead of the feed. And this is the feed that I installed. I haven't seen any leaks. But once I get some spirited driving, I'll see if there's splashing or anything leaking out of here. But for now, it's good. Now, one thing I did modify was this cover. right? Because, uh, because this uh, line is a little bit higher than, than the clearance was, this wouldn't sit flush. So what I did, I just laid this on, on a piece of wood. And I banged it down with a hammer, a rubber mallet right here just to push this down because these are you know they if you look at them this way they're recessed down but, but what I did is push this up and right there the way the lines the fuel lines going and you know let's move this out of the way if I can new problems fuel line on the way all right move this out of the way so if you grab this and put it on, all four corners go down as they should. And I have room for my wiring to go down that hole and the hardware. I hope I didn't misplace it, but it's somewhere in here. <laughs> but for now, this will stay off because, like I said, I, I want to make sure I'm going to monitor this and see what's going on and then decide how I'm going to approach it. But for now... I'm going to pull the car out, I'm going to clean it, and then I'm going to go to Cars and Coffee because today is Cars and Coffee.
so this is just tire cleaner bleach white and it's good for removing the soot from my rear bumper all I do is spray it and then just rinse it off and if I still see more of that carbon stuck on the bumper then I'll spray it again I'll scrub it with a rag and then rinse it off Okay, so as I was leaving to go to Carson Coffee, I turned on my AC and it wasn't working. So this is what I did. Um, I took out my, uh, my scanner. This is the uh, scan tool that I use, in case anybody's wondering, all right? And what I did was uh, I plugged it in and first I checked my fuse, then I checked my relay and they were good. So then I put the scanner on and I turned on the AC compressor clutch because the PSI on my system is still good and I, and I didn't crack it open. So I checked the pressure, it was still good and the compressor wasn't on. So what I did is that I activated the clutch with the, uh, the scan tool and it's clicking on. So I was okay, my electrical system for my clutch is working as it should. However, my AC is not working. So when you have a 8th gen Honda Civic and you tune it with Honda, sometimes the, uh, the tune will get corrupted. Right? And when I had few problems when the car died out, I was trying to re-upload the, the map and stuff like that. Then when I towed the car home, I uh, re-uploaded the map to the uh, Flash Pro just in case to see if that was an issue with the map. And it, the car was still giving issues. Right? Anywho, then I replaced the fuel system and the car started and it was working fine. However, um, just now as I'm trying to leave, I noticed that the AC wasn't working and that and after all the testing that I did, I was like, well, let me re-upload the map. So I have two maps on my, on my Flash Pro, and I uploaded map two. Well, first I uploaded map one again, just in case, and it's, the AC still didn't work. Then I uploaded map two, and the AC kicked on, which tells me that map one on my Flash Pro is corrupted. So hopefully, I can pull it from my computer and re-upload it to my uh, Flash Pro, 
and try it again see if it works because map one is my send it map map two is the more conservative not full send map for my car but even though i still have to get the car retuned you know i like to have make sure that everything's working properly and right now map one on my flash pro is not working properly so i need to figure that out and once i figure that out they don't get the car tuned properly and whatnot but the map is eventually just gonna be obsolete for my car however i like to keep historical maps on my car because i am going to be doing the same supercharger stuff to this one and i want to use those historical maps to get a, the what you call your startup maps and base tools for that car so that's what that is anyway now that my ac is working because it is hot i'm gonna go head out to cross and coffee even though it looks like it might rain but i don't care i'm gonna show up anyway all right all right so i drove down the block and the car did not like the, uh, the second map so I re-uploaded the first map but the AC is not working so I'm just gonna deal with it later on when I get home I'll upload the other map back into the uh, flash pro and try again see if I can fix uh, map one and obviously map two does not like the, uh, the new setup so we're going back to map one yeah so let's let's roll so So map one, you know, the it's a little rich, but the car likes it. Hey, it goes those birds that don't like people. <laughs> but yeah, map one is definitely not sputtering and fighting with me while driving. So that's way better. But like I said, no AC. So I'll just turn that off, uh, keep the vent on. And I got visors because it looks like it might rain. I might also grab some uh, one shot wipers. But traction control kicking in as it should. But let's turn that off. Yeah. cars and coffee hanging out chilling everybody doing their thing and a little front end conversion to Integra got a K swap over there with a turbo might be a contender for a little run I heard this car pulling up. 
I want to see what's under there. Ooh. Old school. Sending it. Sounded good too. You got some more old schools over here. Some more old schools over there. Got some more right here looking right. But I like that one way better. A 944. Hopefully it's got the right engine in. Here we got another case swapped EF. Very nice. My boy might show up today. Show you his CRX. He's always out. If you guys know one of the true unicorns, this is it. This is a specific paint that was made for this car when it came out. Very rare combination. My cousin loves her sales and he would definitely appreciate this one. This is something you don't see every day. You see him in Puerto Rico, but you don't see him here. Alright, so remember you guys when I talked about the uh, map sensor crapping out of my car? This is the guy that hacked me out. He, uh, he took his sensor out of his engine. I get, and brought it to my house so I can get my car running. Like, like, I got friends like that. By the way, we're in Cars and Coffee and he brought his race car. I want to show it to you guys. So tell, tell us briefly what you brought. So, it's a combination of what... Uh, it's a Nissan. Technically, it's a Nissan. So, it's a 3.5 uh, GTR RS uh, supercharged. Uh, that is a straight up a race car. The thing is, but not built. It's not built? It's not built. Okay. It's, yeah, it's not built. It's but. You know, like one of those new cars, whatever that is, you buy and it's freaking by oh, itself from, from the factory. Uh, it's, it's but uh, not built. It's but not built. Exactly. Uh, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the thing does super fast in the quarter mile. I haven't tested it yet, but according to the to the brochure, it's fast as fuck. The brochure, okay. Yes. Yeah, brochure. You can fit seven people in there. If you seven have, on if the you, yes, if you have it in DR, it will be like 14. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. If you're in Mexico, it will be like 77 pounds. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it's more, more than an Abosuaki Beetle. Alright, so, yeah. you want to show us the car? So, yeah, it's right here. Alright, let's take a look at it. <laughs> so, as you can see right here, it is a Nissan GTR Type R S 3.5 Turbo Supercharged. Ooh! And it's the race car. Okay, gotcha. It's, it's a race car. <laughs> so, my friends, obviously, they got a sense of humor. It says, his cars, says his cars are currently going under the, uh, under the knife and being also fixed and repaired. Uh, he didn't bring his out here, so he just came out to hang out <laughs> in his uh, race car. <laughs> you should see the front. The front? Okay, let's see. Let's check out the front. He's got, he's got a cool bag. Uh oh. Uh, it's the same. Not the but only one around here <laughs> with a sense of humor. It's the same, but you know, it's this. It uh, shows oh. you pretty much everything, oh. right? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Want to see the engine bay, bro? You don't want. You don't want. You don't want to see the engine bay. No. Let's, just, <laughs> let me, let's just leave it there. Yeah. All right. Too much modification on that engine, man, for you. That's how we do a car coffee. We always have fun. 